Good evening and welcome to another episode of the Decameron Film Festival. We are in the middle of the festival and we have a great week ahead of us, the rest of the week. Tomorrow we have E. Michael Jones uh, joining us and on Friday Alexander Dugin and on Saturday David Cole. And you can find the whole schedule on guidetoculture.org forward slash Decameron. So make sure to go in and check the schedule there. We have we still have a couple of weeks to go. And uh, you can follow us on Telegram, Guide to Culture, K-U-L-C-H-U-R, on Telegram. That is the best place to follow us to keep up with the festival. We post updates a couple of times every day. So several times per day, we post updates there. So make sure to stay in touch with us. You can see these live streams on DLive, on Entropy, and on Odyssey. And you can also follow the replays. If you don't catch the live streams, you can always catch the replay on Odyssey and on our BitChute channel. And I have just now uploaded the last couple of episodes uh, so you can see them there and I'll post them in the Telegram group right after this live stream. And if you have any questions for us, you can send super chats via entropy. That is entropystream.live forward slash GTK. So you can send the uh, Super chats, that is questions, comments, donations, etc. And now it's time to welcome our guest for tonight from Finland, Tony Jalonen. How are you doing? I'm doing fine, thanks. How are you? Very good to have you on board. Uh, please tell our guests a bit about who you are and what you do. Well, um, uh, a nationalist activist. Uh, I used to be in the Finns Party Youth uh, before um, uh, it went downhill and got destroyed. And um, I'm also active in Suomen Sisu, which is the largest nationalist uh, organization in Finland. And uh, currently, I have. Um, I'm focusing most of my attention on Sunda, which is uh, a cultural collective me and some of my friend, friends uh, started because we felt Finland was missing this kind of uh, nationalist organization which focuses on art and culture and stuff like that. And uh, if I remember correctly, you do have a, a background associated with film, some sort of film education, or you have done some work in film. Is that correct? Uh, yes, some some like amateur work back in the right. day, but but I am a, a film aficionado, so to speak, a film buff have have been all my life. So this is this is a great chance to uh, <laughs> get to talk about film. Perfect. So uh, you picked a film, uh, the perfect film for film aficionados. You picked uh, Fitzcarraldo, Werner Herzog, Klaus Kinski, Pure Madness in the Jungle. <laughs> How come you picked this film? Um, it's a film I saw originally like uh, over 10 years ago. And uh, it, it has stuck with me, the idea of... Uh, doing something that mad like uh, yeah like madness in the jungle which i'm sure we'll talk about but it uh, i i didn't see it in years and then i got invited uh, to this show and uh, you asked uh, what what movie i'd like to talk about uh, fitzcarraldo came to mind as uh, yeah it, it has stuck with me and now I actually yesterday rewatched it, and uh, mm. it, it was glorious, as I remembered. <laughs> it sure is. It, it, there are so many, many interesting aspects of the film, uh, visually, the acting, the characters, the directing, the film music, uh, everything is, is, is just perfect. So... Um, Let's let's take it away. And uh, this is interesting because I, I sent you a message earlier today and asked if you know which language is the original release of the movie because I was watching a copy of the movie where I could choose the 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 audio track, the spoken language between German and English. And you know, I have the impression that it's uh, that that it's a German original, but when you look at the English voices 
they fit the, the mouth movements better. So I get the impression that it's actually recorded in English first. So it, do you know what's up with that? Uh, no, uh, actually I don't. And that's kind of interesting. Maybe maybe it has something to do with uh, uh, there being the, the cast and maybe crew being of uh, you know different nationalities and uh, then of course the film was uh, released in Germany uh, as as uh, Herzog is German so right right but I, I watched it actually in German the German dub uh, so uh, yeah. Right, I wonder yeah. if there's some. I wonder if there's some difference there between the original English and the German dub. I don't know. Exactly. As far as I understand, they recorded it in English, but then did voiceovers for everyone because the cast mm. is of a very mixed sort of nationality. So, uh, although they recorded it in English, I think the first release is in German. So this is a very weird thing that when you watch the German the German um, with with a German audio you and with a, an English subtitle they've translated it back into English so it's it's a different uh, the words are different than the original recording in English. It's it's very it's very weird and it fits the eccentric nature of the film that that, that it is a lot of back and forth. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. So, uh, so how about ju let's just dive into the film and and uh, tell me about some uh, some roads you want to go down and talk about this film and uh, and we'll we'll get the ball rolling. Um, well, uh, the most obvious obvious thing about the film is the uh, part where they pull pull up the ship up the hill. Uh, so that's the most famous famous thing, and I think the most interesting thing. And um, uh, ha have you seen the making of documentary of of Fitzcarraldo? I, I haven't seen all of it. No, I've I've seen these sections where Klaus Kinski is freaking out and yelling at everyone and calling them uh, insane madmen when he is obviously the insane one. Uh, uh, and uh, it, there are some very famous, beautiful scenes, sort of behind the scenes uh, in, in the making of the film. And uh, mm -hmm. of course, uh, Herzog and Kinski had this love-hate relationship. <laughs> they worked together and hated each other. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. But, but please talk about that, yes. Yeah, well, I haven't seen the documentary either, except for the for the clips you mentioned, but it it seems interesting to me that the film is kind of about a, a madman pulling a ship over a cliff, and then the making of documentary, which is about Herzog, it's also about a madman pulling a ship up a cliff, since they actually pulled uh, in a huge uh, streamer up the cliff. So it's a uh, if it's it's the thing that stuck with me back when I saw it that people are capable of the most um, incredible feats and and uh, ridiculous feats like like pulling a ship up a cliff. It's uh, what purpose did it serve except for of course making the film. So that that uh, I think it tells us something about human nature uh, that we are prepared to do, prepared to follow our dreams. Like in the movie, uh, I wrote it down. Um, Fitzcarraldo's wife says in the beginning that only dreamers can move mountains, and I think that was very fitting, uh, both within the movie and in the making of the movie. Absolutely, yeah, and uh, I, I think that is the sort of the underlying theme of the film is um, is about these projects, and, and and no matter what project we have in mind, um, in the end, it, it had it is sort of uh, it is a dream or it is some sort of fanatic uh, willpower that makes us do things, and in the end, you can always ask the question what was the purpose of doing it 
and and you know some people might say well you, you you people do things to get make money and become wealthy but but what is the purpose of that i mean you, there's always an end point at which you have to ask um you know the if it isn't the 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 undertaking of the task itself that is its own reward that is the, the that is the goal in itself to to do something difficult and accomplish something just because yeah and uh, of course in the movie uh, Fitzcarraldo did have a goal in mind but but in case of Herzog and the crew uh, their goal was to make the movie and um, well, within the movie, it kind of is bookended. The idea is bookended with first uh, the wife saying that uh, dreamers can move mountains, and in the end, when uh, when finally Fitzcarraldo doesn't uh, achieve his goal, but the uh, ship goes downstream and uh, through the rapids, but then he uh, tells the story about the first man who saw the Niagara Falls and uh, told everyone about it and nobody believed him asked him for proof and the man just said uh, my proof is that i have seen it so i think that's that's interesting that uh, is the is the journey more important than the, or the experience more important than actually achieving some achieving something uh, you know physical you can grasp I think I think that was uh, a beautiful idea to think about. Of course, yeah, but and also, um, yeah, they they go through this whole process so that he can set up and set, set up an opera, uh, but but that in itself is also a sort of an immaterial gain because it's it's a creative, it's an artistic, aesthetic um, creation in the end. It, it is something that he wants to create just to create it because he has this beautiful yeah. vision. Of an opera that he wants to uh, create in the middle of the of the jungle, of course. So, so I mean, uh, and and I think that's interesting, and I think it's interesting also that he um, he doesn't have a lot of money, and it's only his own faith and his fanaticism, his insanity, that gets people on board. <laughs> <laughs> in the end, because in the end, the, the crew abandons him, and the, they're able to include the these these um, tribes, these jungle tribes, <laughs> basically uh, into the uh, into the task. Yeah, and the tribes uh, see him as a some kind of a white god and uh, with the glorious ship. And uh, yeah, it's it's interesting. And then, the, of course, in the when they finally get the ship over the cliff, the natives, uh, you know, cut the ropes and set the ship downstream to to you know uh, please the please the spirits with this uh, holy ship that they have pulled across. So it's uh, ironic, but also makes sense makes sense uh, in its own way. Right. right. So, uh, I mean, there, there are so many aspects of the film that that, that are uh, amazing. Uh, uh, of course, the music by Popol Vuh is also uh, adds something to the film and adds to, mm -hmm. to several films, of course. Uh, it, and, it's and, it's and also, extremely dreamy. Also Caruso's music, Popol Vuh and uh, Caruso. Yes. Yeah, yeah you want to say, say something about that? Yeah. Yeah, uh, I think the scene which uh, stuck with me the most now when I watched it was the was the scene where they finally get the ship moving up the cliff, and it's a, a long shot of the ship going on this angle, and uh, and Popol Vuh is playing in the background. It's it it, it was a glorious scene to watch. Uh, and also all the scenes where uh, where the ship is going on the stream and uh, there are shots of the jungle and of the rapids and um, the music is playing it's um, it's it's powerful stuff it's it's very slow when i and and uh, this is something that i've mentioned on the on the show before that you know these films that uh, are set on a river, and you know, you know, Fitzcarraldo, you have uh, Aguirre, you have uh, things like Apocalypse Now, 
uh, it's sort of these rivers that take you into unknown territory. There is something inherently traditionalist about that, because I would say the spirit of the spirit of the modern world is to demystify everything and to make everything uh, sort of analyze everything in a in a lab, basically, and and make it. Um, make it scientific and make it known. Whereas the, the, the river and the jungle, at least to me, uh, represents the deep unknown and we go into completely uncharted territory. And I and there's just something seductive about that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And uh, all, the, all the films you mentioned, uh, I'm very fond of Aguirre and uh, Apocalypse Now, because maybe, maybe it's uh, this adventurous side of humans that, uh, that you know that kind of stuff calls to to it but also uh, a great great scene was uh, when they start uh, when they start encountering the, the natives and they are on the river and all you hear is the drums in the jungle and then uh, Fitzcarraldo puts on some caruso from a gramophone and uh, it's it's a great great scene of I think uh, the modern world meeting with the primitive world, and then the drums uh, quiet down, and all you hear is the Caruso in the jungle. It's uh, yeah, it's uh, it's it's great. Gave me chills actually, actually though, to see that. <laughs> yeah, um, and uh, it, it it is, and 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 just this. I don't know. There is something. Someone wrote in the comments here that there's something Faustian. There, this is a sort of an embodiment of uh, the the European Faustian spirit, the trailblazer, the obsession with doing the impossible, and and also this element of the untamed of of the un. And I, I've mentioned this on the show many many times before. This is something that I think I think inherently in in. Uh, writers and uh, storytellers like H.P. Lovecraft, for example, that is also something about, you know, it, it is outside of bourgeois society. It's outside of everything that is known and analyzed in modern society. There, there is something deep uh, and uncontrolled, untamed uh, out there. And, and I, there's just something that I think the, the sort of the right wing or the... the uh, conservative subconscious side of our of our psyche of our nature is is drawn to that yeah definitely and uh, actually while i was watching the movie and making some notes i wrote down a faustian spirit uh, so yeah the commentator was uh, spot on there mm. there's def definitely this uh, in the in the european spirit there is this um, desire for the unknown to tame the unknown uh, and to tread uh, uh, new paths and um, this movie is was a great example i think of that for mm. sure it's a sort of a restlessness mm. so uh, yeah. tell me about some other aspects of the film that uh, that you've thought about <sighs> Well, uh, of course, uh, Klaus Kinski's performance uh, is um, is uh, is great. He, he's a he's a powerhouse of an actor uh, in all all roles. But uh, yeah, I think uh, he was uh, he can do you know subdued acting like uh, emotional slow acting, but he can also be very energetic, like the scene in the in the bell tower of the church where he's, he's yelling that uh, I will have my opera house and the church stays closed and he, he bangs the bell and it's a, it's a powerful stuff. Sometimes I wonder if, uh, you know, if he's acting or if he's just himself when he's, when he's acting. <laughs> Because it's well known that he was he was a maniac in real life as well. Uh, of course, in the recording of this film, it's famously uh, he famously fights with not only the director but with everyone else. Uh, and 
he, he did some some pretty uh, pretty dark things in his own private life. So, <clears throat> and and I wonder if that's a necessary part of genius because a person who is completely well adapted to society, I wonder if they are able to 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 have such a genius. Mm, yeah. Yeah, definitely an interesting, interesting person and actor, and also, uh, yeah, in the making of this film, I think uh, the natives hated Kinski because uh, it wasn't in it wasn't in their custom to show emotions, and uh, Kinski did show some uh, powerful emotions, uh, anger and yelling and stuff like that. And uh, there's a story about uh, the native chief who offered to Herzog that uh, he, he can kill Kinski for him. <laughs> but Herzog uh, thought about it and then replied that no, we need him to finish the movie. So <laughs> thanks, but no thanks. <laughs> yeah, and of course Herzog is equally equally eccentric. Um, uh, well, maybe not equally eccentric, but, but very eccentric still. <laughs> I think in a different way, like in a in a super calm way and uh, yeah he's he's definitely uh, bizarre he can be bizarre and eccentric but uh, i think the, there's a reason why um, why they made uh, five films together and i think no other director worked with kinski a second time even mm. uh, they their eccentricities and their craziness i think they complemented each other somehow Mm. Yeah, none of these films. Um, let, let's just say that 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 both of those two men, both of those two characters, are necessary ingredients in those in those great films. Uh, none of none of those films would have been equally legendary uh, if either of them was was sort of out of the picture, right? Uh, if it was just uh, a mere mortal <laughs> doing either of the jobs, leading leading and di directing. Or playing these uh, these main parts. Yeah, yeah, I agree. So uh, let me see here if we have any. Uh, we have a question. <clears throat> Bingle sends uh, three U.S. dollars a super chat uh, on entropy. He says, "Have you guys read Conquest of the Useless Herzog's diary, written during the making of the film? It sounds like hyperbole when he claims to be." as good a writer as a filmmaker, but it actually isn't. Uh, have you read uh, this book by Herzog? Uh, no, I actually just heard about it while uh, reading some stuff about the movie, but definitely, definitely I will check that out as well as the making of documentary. But the title, title is great. I think it came, it came up in the movie as well, The Conquest of the Useless. I, I think uh, Fitzcarraldo said it at some point, but yeah, I, I, it's uh, it kind of describes the the point we spoke of earlier, which is the doing something for seemingly no real purpose except for you know immaterial uh, artistic goals. So mm -hmm. there is also. Um... Uh, Vingel sends another three U.S. dollars. Says that he will g give more later. Thank you so much. Uh, a, a, a very loyal and, and great supporter of uh, of this channel. Thank you so much, Vingel. Uh, there's also an interesting aspect of Herzog and his uh, his master class. I don't know if you've seen it. The his master class where he talks about making films, where it's sort of uh, where he talks a bit about his love of literature, which. Uh, sort of would hint at him being a good writer himself and he talks about even going to iceland to to uh, uh to see the original copy of uh, uh i think it is the edda that, that that they have in a in a sort of a big uh, bank vault vault under underground so you had to go down in an elevator into this sort of huge bomb shelter like some sort of Fort Knox thing where it goes in and he he wanted to just hold the the original book in his hand uh, you know just to to feel the greatness of this ancient literature uh, so so he has some uh, eccentric qualities like that and and he's obviously a 
uh, a very literate man as well. Yeah, I, I have actually read a book of his. Um, I was just uh, checking if I can find the name of Walking in Ice, uh, which uh, tells the story, a real story. It's a, it's, it is, um, it's his diary uh, about the trip he took when he, uh, in 1974, yeah, he got a phone call that a friend of his was uh, uh, dying, ill and dying in Paris. So uh, he took a jacket and uh, packed one bag and uh, then walked from Munich to Paris and kept the diary while doing it. So, yeah, I think uh, that's that's uh, uh, very descriptive of Herzog to do do this uh, to undertake this kind of uh, ridiculous uh, physical uh, tasks. Uh, yeah, it's it's something to admire, really, and it shows in his movies, but also in his private life, like like seen here or when he went to see the Edda. Exactly, I'm a fan. I'm a big fan. <laughs> yes. Um... So, uh, so someone in the comments here, Buddy PNG says in the comments that Herzog borrowed all the equipment for his movies. He grew up in the Alps, uh, totally uneducated to filmmaking, and he saw his first movie at 17. And uh, Vingel says that he actually stole his first pro film camera. Uh, and, and I think it is, it is, um, it is interesting that, you know, both him as, as a filmmaker and the character in the film that they don't, uh, uh, you know, creating a, a, a genius piece of art uh, can be achieved and accomplished with um, with willpower, with uh, passion, with uh, w with a vision, a very uh, a powerful vision. <clears throat> and if you have those things, you can accomplish a lot even without a lot of money. And I think that speaks to uh, you know, it speaks to to the the, the right wing movement, the nationalist movement. Uh, we don't have we don't have any resources. We don't have any money, uh, and it's but so we we have to be driven by this uh, idea of uh, you know build it and they will come. You know, <laughs> it's like if we uh, if the only thing we have, the only thing we really bring to to the table is our passion and our vision. And we can only hope and we can only be passionate enough so that the fire spreads from our minds to everyone else and they will be fired up so that they will join us in this project. And that is the only way it can become successful. So in a way, we have to be like Fitzcarraldo. We have to be like Herzog. We have to uh, have a, a dream that is passionate enough to accomplish the impossible. Yeah, exactly. That was uh, that that really came to mind while watching the food film. That uh, yeah, us as nationalists in this current age, we are pulling the streamer up the cliff, uh, and to uh, to accomplish what? Uh, not monetary gain, not any you know uh, stuff like that, but the immaterial goal of you know preserving our people and uh, our the beauty of the world etc it's uh, these ideas that we are chasing and uh, yeah that's probably one reason why uh, Fitzcarraldo and uh, maybe Aguirre and uh, Herzog himself uh, speaks to us yeah for sure there is definitely something, uh, uh, something powerful and 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 very sort of European Faustian about uh, about him as a filmmaker. And I, I don't know anything about his his own political views, but it tends to be that um, you know artists uh, and and uh, you know including filmmakers, they don't have very clear political ideas. They have aesthetic ideas, and and they they aren't always aware of. 
what those aesthetic ideas mean in terms of you know real society <laughs> you know it, it's sort of like this sometimes they can be dreamers and they can they can uh, be this sort of the typical sort of artistic mind which is a bit uh, uh, you know up up in the air and the, not really understands the 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 concrete reality that we have to deal with and sometimes they don't understand the implications of their own aesthetic visions you know that that this is actually something extremely european <laughs> you know and, and maybe maybe they don't really understand it themselves yeah and uh, i don't know if you if you have seen herzog's documentaries but the same themes are there as well uh, it uh, was the one documentary where he went to, was it the antarctica or uh, some extreme location and uh, talk to the scientists who live there in extreme conditions and then uh, of course uh, grizzly man is a pretty famous documentary where where he uh, examined the life of uh, this man who spent his life uh, you know studying bears and living among bears and then died b uh, killed by a bear uh so yeah there's there's definitely uh you know a, a continuing theme in all his work in documentaries and in fiction films so mm -hmm. very faustian indeed as, mm -hmm. as as we said earlier yeah yeah and a, another film that i really like uh, with the two of them is cobra verde it is another one uh, where, where it's sort of colonial attitudes with uh, Kinski as an absolute madman, <laughs> a fantastic madman. It, it, I, I don't know. There, there's something, yeah. There's something great about that film, and and uh, I don't know. It, it it is it is just something something extremely genuine. He doesn't hold anything back, and that's why people love him as an actor because he's so genuine. Yeah, I, I actually saw Cobra Verde like over 10 years ago. I don't really remember much of it, but I, I will surely uh, check it out. Mm. I've seen I've seen um, Aguirre many times and uh, and uh, Nosferatu is, uh, and Wojciech. Those are uh, the ones I've been watching more, but uh, I will definitely rewatch Cobra Verde. Mm -hmm. So when you came on the show, uh, I uh, I was expecting you to pick a um, uh, a Kaurus Mackie film <laughs> as a, as a Finn. How come you how come you didn't pick a Kaurus Mackie film? Uh, well, um, <clears throat> I I am actually a big fan of Aki Kaurus Mackie, and uh, I I thought about those films, but then uh, Fitzcarraldo came to mind somehow maybe it was uh, maybe it was because there is uh, this um, this theme of struggle and uh, chasing a dream which is uh, relevant to uh, this show i think and uh, the right wing audience so yeah but i i'll definitely talk with you uh, about cosmicky some some day if you if you like i i have something i have something to say about those films as well but uh, fitzcarraldo, fitzcarraldo seemed fitting uh, for this show definitely yeah it is it is and we've talked about other uh herzog films uh before uh, on the on this show so it was about time we talked about this film um mm -hmm. so are there any other things you want to bring up about the film uh, any other sort of uh aspects uh, well one aspect of course uh, which we could talk about was the was the use of the natives in the film i i read that uh, herzog got uh, criticism for exploiting natives and not being different from uh, you know the rubber companies back in the day which you know used the natives almost like uh, slave labor to haul the rubber uh, in the jungle. So 
Yeah, do you have something to say about that? Where they need to ex exploit it uh, for the sake uh, of small? I just find it extremely amusing how they're portrayed. Uh, there's especially one scene that I find hilarious in the film, and that is when they when they're sort of building or when they're preparing to pull the the big the boat um, up the the hill. And they're they're sort of preparing the ground for it, and they they're looking through this measuring uh, equipment. I, I don't know what it's called. The, the, that sort of um, that measuring tool, uh, and so they're using one of the natives' spear as as a measuring instrument. You know, they're looking at the spear through this thing, and and the and the, the the native is holding the spear. But instead of the the you know the crew member holding the spear himself or going around he just takes this little indian uh, and moves the indian around instead of moving the spear it's like the indian holds the spear and he moves the, the little indian <laughs> around and uses him as as a tool it's it is just absolutely hilarious there are so many scenes like that in, in this film and especially in cobra verde that are absolutely insane uh, but yeah, that's. Uh, I don't think they'd get away with with uh, doing that in a film today. Yeah, and uh, the scene came to mind where uh, where uh, Fitzgeraldo hands the chief the block of ice, <laughs> and uh, they they say that uh, they don't they don't know it's going to melt, and the chief you know turns it in his hands and then shows it to the, all the workers and the old workers watching all. The, this thing it, it's a uh, it's kind of funny absolutely yes yeah yeah no i'm th th those those aspects are interesting and uh it is it is uh it's sort of tiring it's it's tiresome that you can't you can't do anything like that in a film today um because that actually reflects how history has been that is uh, that is really how people have interacted in the past, and and uh, the the honesty of it is, uh, I mean, that's what makes it interesting to watch a film when a film can be actually honest, and that is the difference between these kinds of film. I, okay, Fitzgeraldo is pretty much a mainstream film, but but most mainstream films aren't that honest. Most mainstream films are just tri completely trivial entertainment because uh, everything is sugar coated. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's uh, refreshing to watch these older, older movies uh, for that reason that uh, they don't uh, sugarcoat things. And um, nowadays, anything can be viewed through a lens of uh, is this uh, oppression or is this uh, you know whatever cultural appropriation. Oh, but uh, they are pieces of history, and uh, it, it's a good thing that uh, they do exist. Uh, I'm just worried about worried about the moviegoers today, like uh, younger people who don't necessarily watch older films, and they watch this Hollywood Hollywood nonsense with nothing then that can be viewed as uh, offensive or like that so they are i think they are missing something when they're fed this uh, uh this uh, stuff with uh, no taste if you know what i mean absolutely and, and that's also why um you know sometimes uh, you know viewers have criticized us for talking about uh, depressing films about uh, art, films that are too quote unquote artsy, uh, pretentious uh, films that are too uh, unrelatable in a way, dark, horrible. <laughs> but the the point is that you have to also challenge yourself. You can't just criticize, you know, the left or the mainstream for 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 being too easy on themselves and just watching things that is trivial. You also have to. You know, challenge your own sensibilities in some ways, and and there are films out there that are difficult to watch, but still have some sort of value. Yeah, yeah, definitely. But um, outside the Hollywood mainstream, I think. Uh, oh yes, 
but in, back in the day, even Hollywood films could uh, could do you know stuff that would now be considered offensive, etc. So there's definitely a change in uh, in the film film culture and the film industry. It's just uh, it's interesting to see what the future brings, especially especially now when uh, when the Oscars are becoming more and more woke. And uh, I just saw a graph of uh, the viewers for each Academy Awards, and uh, it has gone downhill. And the latest one, I think, which was I I guess the most woke. I haven't watched it in years, but. Uh, mm-hmm. Uh, it uh, the ratings you know plummeted and nobody nobody watched it so uh, if that will have some kind of effect on what kind of movies they're going to make in hollywood or uh, something i don't know but it's surely interesting Absolutely. Uh, yeah, I, I was actually going to talk about that on my morning show uh, and, and this is an interesting thing um, I'm, I'm reading here from one article. The Academy Awards television audience plunged to 9.8 million viewers on ABC, uh, and that makes it 58% below last year's uh, number of 23 million, which was the previous least watched Oscars. So, <laughs> and I think in, in like four or five years, it's gone down to a fourth of the viewership. And Usually these days, uh, in the last five, six, maybe ten years, the, the films that have won are films I haven't heard about and and uh, are uh, films that I'm not interested in at all. That that didn't used to be the case, and and now it is more politicized. It's more woke, just like you say. And I think it's interesting that we see this uh, just automatic you know boycott basically that people are not interested in that trash uh, and it's not interesting it's not relatable it has nothing to do with us and uh, it it just it just turns the the oscars or the academy award into into yet another sort of leftist institution that no one cares about and it's sort of it's it's history now and it it loses its value because who cares about getting getting a reward from from a corrupt institution like that? And it's it's interesting because it's it's a, it's a part of the collapse of society. No one, no one, even the presidential election ha- doesn't have any credibility anymore. The Oscars don't have any credibility anymore. It's a, it's like there's a split in society where where you know the the people keeping up appearances in the mainstream are on one side, and the the actual world normal people are on the other side. Yeah, and uh, back when uh, I still watched the Academy Awards, I uh, I uh, found it funny that uh, there was this one year where uh, I think there were no black actors uh, nominated, and that caused, of course, an uproar. And where are all the black nominees? And then the next year, all the winners were black actors. So they went the opposite way. But it, uh, I think, it showed the uh, showed the corruption of the of the academy that they they you know pandered these uh, public uh, uproars and uh, stuff like that. And uh, yeah, like you said, nobody nobody cares about that or uh, or uh, the actors giving their uh, thank you speeches and. Their speeches consist of politics and bashing Trump, etc. But uh, as I heard uh, of the of the latest Academy Awards, uh, I was surprised to hear that uh, one of the actor awards didn't go to Chadwick Boseman, who's of course the uh, hero of Wakanda and all the black people in the world who died. Uh, I was, I was sure sure uh, the award would have went to him, but instead it went to Sir Anthony Hopkins, uh, an older 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 white gentleman, which I mm-hmm. found uh, surprising. For but, which uh, film was that? 
Uh, I'm not even sure. I don't. I don't <laughs> keep up with uh, modern films, but uh, I have heard about it, but I I don't remember. I do think that the Danish uh, film uh, Another Round uh, about drinking with Mats Mikkelsen. It's it's directed by uh, Winterberg. Uh, mm. That won the the award for best foreign film. Uh, that's actually an interesting film, and I, I I have to say I really enjoyed watching that film. Yeah, I have seen some uh, Winterberg's films, and they are very good. And I actually liked Parasite, which of course last year won the foreign foreign picture and as well as the best picture overall, I believe. Mm -hmm. Because these foreign films seem to be more more interesting than the Hollywood Hollywood. Uh, nonsense they churn up but do Maybe. you think uh, yeah do you think uh, if if Fitzcarraldo was made today in Germany uh, would it win academy awards because uh, i don't think uh, i don't think it would it would be the center of attention because of uh, oh the poor natives and uh, this 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 is uh, white privilege etc uh, oh yeah what is, it would be boycotted. It wouldn't be uh, admitted in in polite society. It would, uh, it, yeah. I think it would be completely rejected by by the the film main. and for obvious reasons. And, and and this is this is the interesting thing. And the, many films that are now classics that we've talked about on this show, we've mentioned that that you know they couldn't have been made today. And that's that. It's it's an interesting. It's like a category of films itself. And and you know. Quite possibly, it's most films <laughs> in history because any film made more than twenty years ago would be seen as offensive by today's standards because that's how quickly it's all drifting uh, to the left in in terms of values. And uh, you know, a film like Psycho, for example, uh, Hitchcock's Psycho, with uh, a transvestite, uh, probably gay murderer. I mean, you can make a film like that with with him as the crazy bad guy uh, and <laughs> there are so many many examples uh with with the same thing uh, the texas chainsaw massacre uh I, I think there are aspects of that that couldn't have been made today anything really with with um, transvestites portrayed as crazy murderers which was like in the past that has been an aspect of uh, of psychos, you know, to to make them even crazier, they have made them into transvestites. You couldn't do that today. Yeah, uh, one exception I think is the uh, Rocky Horror Picture Show and the uh, Rocky Horror uh, Musical, which of course the main villain is uh, transvestite from Transylvania, etc. But I think uh, that's uh, light-hearted and the uh, queer community has uh, embraced it. So that's not a big deal. He's not he's not portrayed as the evil killer, for example. He's just the, uh, you know the well the main character actually. But yeah, we do have uh, we do have another uh, super chat, a very generous super chat on entropy, uh, and that is Patriot Dawn. He says the following. Uh, he says. FT DNA and analyzes me as 5% Finnish plus 5% Baltic in addition to my Scandinavian uh, and and German and British Isles estimated DNA. I say hello to both Frody and Tony help uh, plus and help Frody pay his streaming bill and he sends 50 US dollars. Thank you so much. Yeah, that is course. very generous. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. Um, yeah, no, uh, th th that is definitely true. It's it's even the the least, uh, even the most inoffensive uh, elements of of previous films <clears throat> will be interpreted as, oh, that's that's too offensive. We can't have that. And in the end, we're only left with this sort of passive aggressive Teletubbies world where everything is just nondescript and and soft and round because no one will take offense. Perhaps someone can take offense uh, against that as well. Yeah, but but it is it is a, just a mental deterioration. Yeah. Yeah. Silence of the Lambs is another example. Says Dan here, definitely. 
so uh, we've been going for fifty uh, minutes. Uh, is there is there any are there any final thoughts you want to bring up before we wrap this up this conversation? Mm, final thoughts. Well, maybe I, I'd like to encourage everyone on the right side and. Uh, why not on the left side as well to watch uh, Fitzcarraldo and Aguirre and all Herzog's films. They are, they really speak to the European spirit, the Faustian spirit, and uh, can be seen as metaphors of our own struggle uh, to achieve our dreams. And uh, Herzog has shown that, uh, that uh, dreamers can move mountains. He has, uh, successfully undertaken these tasks and uh, we shouldn't uh, be uh, swallowing black pills that oh it's all lost we can't do anything we can look at herzog uh, as an example that yes yes we can we just need to be a little crazy <laughs> <laughs> yeah completely agree i think that is the, the best thing we have going for us is uh, uh, a beautiful vision and the passion with which we pursue that vision, and I think that can infect others with, uh, you know, our fire in our in our minds and in our hearts. And that is really how we can get more and more people on board. And that is more powerful than money and uh, media and anything because that that has uh, it has a greater power to 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 uh, to last over a longer time as well. So thank you so much for this. This has been a great conversation. Uh, do you have any any link you want to plug anywhere people can find your work, or maybe it's just available in Finnish? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, mostly in Finnish. So if you are a Finnish uh, speakers, uh, you can check out my Twitter uh, Twitter account uh, or. Uh, or uh, the website of the Sunta Collective, which is uh, suunta.info. You can find lots of great stuff there if you speak Finnish. So if, if you don't speak Finnish, uh, start learning because you're missing <laughs> out on such, uh, such great stuff. Beautiful, beautiful. All right. Well, thank you so much for watching, everyone. Tomorrow we'll be back with... Um, E. Michael Jones, we're going to talk about a brilliant film uh, called, uh, what's it called? A Simple Man? Uh, I forget what it's called. Let me see here what it's called. Uh, the Cohen Brothers. Film. Yeah, the, uh, A Serious Man, right? I think it's called A Serious, yeah, a serious Man yeah, yeah. from 2009. Yeah. Exactly. A Serious Man from 2009. Uh, Cohen Brothers. It's, it's an interesting take on, um, on uh, the Jewish self-image. Yeah. Uh, so, so I, I think we'll have a very interesting conversation with E. Michael Jones about that. So, so everyone should definitely tune in, check that out. Uh, you can find me on Telegram, Guide to Culture, K U L C H U R. I do a morning show every Monday to Friday, nine uh, in the morning Central European time. So that's nine Stockholm time, uh, eight London time, and it's three in the middle of the night, uh, New York time. But you can uh, tune in on this channel, Guide to Culture, uh, every weekday morning to check out the morning show. It's just easygoing chit-chat, current events, news, commentary. And basically, I talk about anything I want to talk about in the morning. <laughs> so it's not very structured. And you can send news tips uh, on WRS chat, on Telegram. Uh, if you have anything interesting, if you come across anything interesting that you think I should bring up in the, on the morning show, uh, please join that group and send uh, news tips that way. And of course, this channel depends on your support. So if you enjoy what we put out, the videos, and if you get any value out of it, you can help us by going to guidetoculture.org forward slash donate you can send donations through entropy you can send crypto you can send me an email guide to culture at protonmail.com so thank you so much for watching see you tomorrow morning and see you tomorrow evening uh, with uh, e michael jones and thank you tony yeah Let's thanks for thanks for having me yeah definitely okay good night <laughs>